thank you for how much you're clearly doing in the life of this church and community. How much you keep showing up before us and just doing miraculous things. And we pray that that continues as we start worshiping you today and our tithes and offerings and continue to worship you in your word and song and in teaching and in prayer. We just pray for your anointing to fill this room today, God. That everyone leaves experiencing your presence and being refilled so that we can go and pour out to our community. We pray this all in your blessed name, Jesus. Amen. As we're worshiping our tithe and offering, please join with me in reading today's scripture from Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Good morning, everyone. All right. Weather is decent outside, not too cold, not too hot. Feeling energized this morning. Who's ready to worship? All right. Praise God. We got this song we added a few weeks ago. I saw everybody starting to get comfortable with it last week, so I'm really excited. Let's praise him and just have fun. Oh, can we get unmuted? (laughs) Dear hubby. Start it with Anna. Who's? There we oh, go. there you go. <laughs>
is worthy of all the praise. How much do we have to give him this morning, right? How much praise is in our hearts? If it only feels like a little bit, he can turn it into more. He can multiply it. Señor, eres 
mi salvación por tu amor yo tengo redención the Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation my God I will praise you lift up my song my heart and my voice
All right. Oh, there I am. Okay. Um, the kids are going to go down, and we've got some teen helpers going down there. But, um, y'all, this morning, I've just had this overwhelming sense um, that we have a lot of things that we need to be praying for. Uh, we're going to take a moment, and we're going to pause, and um, I'm going to invite you, if you've got something that's weighing heavily upon you, if you have a need that we need to take before God, I'm going to invite you to come down to the altar. Um, we're going to anoint and we're going to pray as a body. We've literally seen the times that we gather together as a community and we pray over one another and for one another. We have seen God perform miracles. Uh, we've literally seen situations drastically change in that moment. And we're going to come before God again this morning. Um, we know that we have neighbors just down the street in Crossroads that suffered a house fire in the past few days, and um, everybody was able to get out of the house but their youngest. And she was rescued from the burning house by um, first responders, and she's still not responsive. Her body says that it's functioning fine, her organs are fine, her oxygen is fine, but her body, her brain is not responding. And we're going to come before the throne of God, and we're going to pray over her. We have several situations that I'm aware of in the church that have been hard things that have unfolded in the last week, two weeks, very recent time. And I'm going to invite you to come down. I've asked Steve to come on down on behalf of Tanner. We've heard the name Tanner. We're praying for Tanner to get a new heart. We're praying for baby Owen, who was born with issues in his heart. We're praying for Logan, who also needs a heart. Y'all, we need to pray for these children. And I know there are many among us who have other needs. So at this time, if you want to come down, we're going to join together as a body. I invite you down if you feel like you want to come down and pray for them. If not, you can stay in your seats. Pray with us. Extend your hand however you feel comfortable. Respond to God in this moment. Do you want to help? And if you're someone who says, I need a touch from God, and you know what, I can't come and kneel at the altar, raise up your hand, we'll come get you. Um, there's wherever you feel comfortable. But we're going to pray. We're going to lift up each of these situations. Yes, ma'am. Heavenly Father, we just come before you as a church body right now. Lord, we, we just thank you for your protection upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the family members who were able to get out of that burning house and who are okay at this moment. Father, we just lift up to you this little girl in the name of Jesus, and we pray that you would step in where medical science and where doctors can't do anything. Lord, you can step in and say no. You can step in and turn this situation into a miracle. Lord, you can bring this little girl back to her family, back to her parents. You can restore to her health. You can restore to her the life that stands before her. Father, we pray in this moment that you would bring peace that could only come from you to this family. Bring them comfort. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would move in a mighty way, that you would touch this family, that you would touch this little girl, that even at these moments that the machines would start showing that yes, she is there, that yes, she is well, that her body is going to make it, that her mind is there. Father God, this is a tough situation all around. We lift up this whole family. We lift up these parents. We lift up the grandparents, extended family. Lord, we lift up the workers who work so hard to get her and her family out and get them to safety. Father, I pray that you would work in them at this moment. Give them peace that passes understanding, Father. And I pray that for anyone in these moments who may not know you, Lord, I pray that in this moment that they would have their ears open to how you are working, that they would hear your truth, that they would feel your love, that they would feel this community of faith rising up around them. And I pray that they would encounter you. Father God, we pray that this precious life would be saved and that it would be known as a miracle done by the God of the universe. Lord, we ask this 
we pray this, we seek this, and we, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus who can do all things. Father God, we pray over Tanner. Lord, we pray over Logan. We pray over baby Owen. Lord, you are working in these situations, Lord, we pray that you would provide what they need, Father, but we know it's such a hard thing to ask because we know what it requires, Lord, and we just pray that you would enter into this situation, that it would be a situation where grace abounds, where, Lord, we just ask for you to step in and for you to make a way. Father God, we pray that you would just move move in a way that we can't see move in a way that we are unaware of Father we ask in the name of Jesus that you would bring healing that you would lift up these families that you would step in that you would make a way because we cannot Lord we bring them before you and we just say Lord may it be may it be you that we see in this and through this may we see your work and may we give you all the glory Lord, we ask for your healing. Father, as we are gathered here at this altar seeking you, we just pray over every person. We pray over every family and every situation that they are here representing. Father, we as a people are standing before you, bringing you all of our hurts, all of our struggles, all of our pain, all of the things that we can't do. And we say, Lord, we know you can. Father, we pray that you would meet us here in this moment, that we would feel your presence here among us. Father, may your spirit fall upon us. Lord, we pray that we would see you at work, that we would feel you at work. Lord, that the the things that we are bringing before you help us to lay them down and know that they are in the best and most capable hands in the universe. Lord, remind us of your love that surpasses our understanding. Lord, meet us in this moment. We pray that you would step into every situation and we pray that you would bring about the miracles that they all need. You can. Lord, we know you have the power. We know that you are capable and we come before you saying, Lord, we can't, but you can. We pray knowing that you are already at work, knowing that you love every person more than we can even begin to understand. Father, make us your hands and your feet and use us as you will. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. I don't know about you, but I don't even know how to preach after that. (laughs) Thank you for joining us in prayer and for lifting up our needs before the throne of God, joining together as the body of believers. A sign was posted outside of this textile mill. And actually, it was posted um, several times within it. And it read, when your thread becomes tangled, call the foreman. Very simple. Not complicated. When your thread tangles, because it's going to happen, call the foreman. Well, a young woman, uh, she's new on the job, brand new, first day. She comes into the mill, and she sees the sun. She's like, okay, okay. Um, She gets started 
she starts doing her job and inevitably the thread starts to um, get bunched up on her and it gets tangled and, and she thinks, well, I'll just fix it. I don't want them to know it's my first day on the job. Um, you know, I can, I can do this. Um, I don't need anybody's help. And, and so she tries to fix it on her own. But what happens is that it just keeps getting worse and worse. You know, knots begin to form and things. The machine is, is not really liking her help. So finally, she decides, okay, I'm going to go get the foreman. And, and so she gets him, hey, I've got a problem going on, but, um, you know, don't worry, I, I did the best that I could. And the foreman stops and looks at her and says, no, you didn't. The best thing you could have done would have been to just get me in the first place. And when I read this story, sometimes I have to think, ouch, um, because I'm that person. I, I don't like to ask for help. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. Not really, because um, I know we don't like to ask for help, do we? The reason I know that is because any time that we want to ask for help, we try to literally do anything else but ask somebody for their help. And we certainly don't appreciate it uh, when somebody has words of wisdom for us. So, well, you could do this a different way. Well, who asked you? Um, or especially when you're a young parent and everybody wants to tell you what to do, you're, stop it. I don't, I don't want your advice. I can do it on my own. We like that feeling of doing it on our own. We like the idea that, you know, we don't have to do what other people tell us to do. I listen, I remember being a teenager being like, listen, when I'm on my own, I'm going to do exactly what I want, when I want, how I want, all that stuff. And then you get to become an adult and that never really happens. Um, but we like that. The culture that we live in, we like our independence. We like not having to listen to somebody else. We like doing things on our own. And sometimes, well, that can be a really good thing. There are other times where that's actually really not a good thing. And today we're going to be looking at independence. We've been looking at the state of humanity, the state of where we are, and I think we are in a state of independence. That's actually your first point. We're jumping right in this morning. Humanity is in a state of independence. Do you think it's fair to say that we live in a world where people do not want to be told what to do? Uh-huh. Have you ever tried to tell someone what to do? Listen, if you've got kids, I know you have, and I know exactly what they've said to you. They've learned a little two-letter two word, two-word that's no. And then, you know, you get a handle on that, and then they become a little bit older, and it's like they refine the word no when you hit your teenage years. <laughs> you hear it again and again and again. Listen, I teach kindergarten. It's hard to get people to do what you want them to do, especially when they do not want to do what you want them to do. Whether it's the right thing to do, whether it's the smart thing to do, whether it's clearly the better way or not, we do not like to be told. I'll do it on my own. I'll do it my way. Even if it's going to take way longer and end up costing me way more money, I'm going to do it my way just to prove that I can do it my way. I think much of the Old Testament... I mean, much of the New Testament, but it's really easy to see in the Old Testament. Much of the Old Testament is actually the people wanting to hold on to this independence. If we even look back to the beginning, look at the Garden of Eden. What is it that got us in trouble? God told us what to do. He told us, well, don't eat from that tree. You could do anything else you want in this garden. Just don't eat from these trees. Just don't do that. Don't, don't touch this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It, it was good and well for a while, but at some point, they decided that they didn't want somebody else telling them what to do. They listened to the serpent who had them, you know, kind of question, well, why did God say that? Why would he tell you that? And then they got it in their head. Well, I know what's right for me. I know what the good choice is. I know what I want to do. And they ate the fruit. They wanted to live independently, to make their own choices, to follow their own way. And, I mean, they did. And they actually chose for the rest of us. They chose to live apart from what God wanted them to do. We get to the next bit of the story, and it's the story of how humanity continues to live independently from God. They don't want 
God. They don't want to serve God. They actually continue to do things their own way. And, and we become so wicked. We become so apart from what God has created us to be that he sends the flood to wipe us out. All but one family. We see the, the stories in the, the first four and five chapters of the Bible, the Pentateuch, about how God reaches out and says, hey, if you will be my people, I will be your God. If you serve me, you're going to be my chosen people. And you're going you're gonna to show the rest of the world what it is like to be in relationship with me. And the people, you know, they agree. They're like, yeah, we'll follow you. You know, we get those Ten Commandments and the people come to Mount Sinai and they're like, yeah, we're totally going to follow these commandments and the laws that you give us and, and we'll serve you. And it isn't, it isn't very long until the people are grumbling and they're like, oh, we should have just stayed in Egypt. It was better when we were slaves. And they start trying to do things their own way. They start trying to live apart from God. They start at times following other gods. We get to the book of Judges, and actually this is where it says it the most clearly in all of Scripture, I think. Uh, when we get to Judges uh, 21, verse 25, says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. They get to the point where they just do whatever they want. We're going to live the way that we see fit to live. Nobody can tell us to live differently. We're God's chosen people. We'll do what I want. It's going to be fine, right? Totally fine. So what happens in the book of Judges, it's literally the cycle again and again and again. The people are rescued by God. God brings them the peace that they're looking for. Normally there's an enemy that's come in and that's taken over where they are. It's making life really miserable. And, and the people... Or like, oh, we don't really like this. And then it gets really bad. There's like persecution level stuff going on. And they're like, oh, we're messed up. We, we need to cry out to God. We need to seek after God. And God will make things right. So they make themselves right with God. They start following the laws. They start following the rules. They start doing the things that they had, you know, said we would do. We're going to make the sacrifices. We're going to pray. We're going to keep the commandments. And then as they seek after God, they cry out to him and say, Lord, rescue us. And then God rescues them. He sends them a judge. He sends them someone who rises up and who leads them to this great victory where they overcome the enemy. And the cycle starts again. Like, oh, things are really, really good. God has rescued us. It's amazing. Yeah, we don't need him so much. We can do it on our own. And then they start walking away from God again. And things get really bad because everybody does as he see fits. As, as he sees fit. One translation says he does what is right in his own eyes. The people did what was right in their own eyes. They choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. And they don't like that God has told them how to live. That they've even agreed to live the way that he has called them to live. And they live as they see fit. And the more that they live as they see fit, the further away from God they walk and the further into bondage they step. If that doesn't sound like the world we live in, then I think we haven't really been familiar with the world around us. We don't like to be told what to do. We don't like it when the government tells us what to do. We don't like it, especially when our boss tells us what to do. We probably don't even like it when the preacher's up here telling us what to do. We don't like it when God tells us what to do. We like to make our own choices to live the way that we want to live, to do what we want to do, and we'll find ways to justify it. But we like to live independent by our own rules how many of us like to ask for help for any reason raise your hand if you like to ask for help yeah no one raise your hand if you will ask for help if it's an absolute necessity but you hate it oh right here come on let's be honest is your hand up yet <laughs> no, he'll ask for help. Raise your hand if you like to be told by someone else. They, they come over and they correct you. You really love it when someone comes over and says, hey, I think you're doing something wrong. 
How many of us have ever said something along the lines of, well, I mean, I don't have to, I've heard this one, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't have to read my Bible every day, like once, once a week is enough. I don't have to, and we like to come up with, with our own rules. The one that I'm hearing a lot lately, um, and I mean, from the church as a whole, is, well, the rules about relationships are so, they're so archaic. They clearly, they, they don't apply to me. That won't fly in our culture today. I can live how I want to live. God's going to be fine with it. Hmm. We like to live the way that we want to live, even though we know the ways God has told us to live. Listen, I'm talking about us in the church. You step out of the church, we want to live independently of everybody else. I can do what I want to do. Usually we'll say as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. But the big mantra for today in our culture is I can do whatever I want to do and you can't say anything about it. I can do whatever I want to do and actually you have to accommodate me in that. You actually have to agree with me in that. We want to live independent from truth. From there, there are no absolute truths anymore is what people will tell you. There are no morals that have to be upheld. There is nothing that I have to adhere to. This is where our world is. This is where many people in our country and in most other countries of the world, this is where we are. We do what we want. Don't try to tell me what to do. The Israelites did it in the Old Testament and we're still doing it today. When the type in this man's printer was getting light, this is back in the day before, you know, uh, right now I just pop out the toner cartridge and put another one in. But something's going wrong. It's getting light. They've got enough ink. And this guy calls the repair shop. He says, hey, something's wrong with my printer. Can, uh, can I bring it into you? Can you, like, clean it or something? And the man on the phone is like, well, yeah, I can. It's going to be 50 bucks, though. That's a lot of money just to come in and, like, clean your printer. Why don't, you, why don't you get the manual, and why don't you read it yourself, and I bet you can take care of this at home. You save yourself $50. The man on the phone is like, well, I mean, that's a great idea, actually. I probably can do that. Does your boss know that you're sending business away? Wouldn't you want to make the $50? And the man on the phone very sheepishly says, it's actually my boss's idea. Because we tend to make a lot more money when you try to fix it yourself first. <laughs> the more we walk away from God and the more we try to live as independently as we can, the more of a mess we make. The more we try to live the way that we want to live and keep our independence, the more messy things get. The more our world walks away from God and from His truth and from His love, the much, much worse it becomes. But we love this idea of our independence and nobody can tell me what to do. But the trouble is, is we were designed for dependence. We were designed for dependence. That's your second point. We are not designed to live independently. We're not designed to live on our own, isolated, doing whatever it is that we want. If you look back in Genesis, when God creates humanity, he creates us in his image. He creates us with the purpose of living in community with Him. We are created to be in this relationship where God is our provider, where God is the one that we look to for guidance and for direction. We are designed to live dependently upon Him. We don't like that. But scripture shows us again and again that apart from God, there's nothing good in this world. We're designed to live with him, dependent upon him, in relationship with him. I want to point us to a passage in Jeremiah that gives us a really good visual. 
for what exactly I'm talking about here. I want to read to you Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land there is no, where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. When we choose to trust in ourselves, when we choose to do things our way, when we want to do it on our own, however it is you want to phrase it, when we choose to live independently of God, we are like this tree that's trying to grow in the desert with nothing around it. We can't grow in this place there. It, it's a barren wasteland. We miss out on the prosperity because we're trying to do it on our own. We're trying to live our own way and do our own thing. But this is contrasted with the one who trusts in God, the one who puts their confidence in God, the one who depends on God. They are like a tree whose roots go down deep. They go deep under the sand. They reach that soil that has the water in it. It grows up by the stream and it grows tall. It grows strong. As much as we see trees grow and their branches spread out above the ground, those trees have just as many roots under the ground and they run deep. And they hold that tree no matter what weather comes their way. No matter if there's a drought going on in the land. If the roots are deep and they are strong, that tree will thrive no matter what. It is when we place our faith and our trust in God and we choose to depend on Him that we become like that tree. When we try to do it our own way, we don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to do what God is telling us to do. We choose to be that independent person. We're going to struggle. We probably aren't even going to make it very far. When drought comes and we don't even have the roots to get through the sand, we're not going to make it. We're going to fall over. We are meant to be in this life-giving relationship with God. And the way we do that is by depending on Him, by giving ourselves to Him, putting our trust in Him. When He said, come and follow me, that's that each of us have heard that in some way. Come, follow me, choose to be like me. When we choose to depend on Him, we leave whatever it is behind and He becomes our focus. He becomes our provider. He becomes the one we look to to meet our needs. We see it all, all the way through Scripture that God continually meets the needs of those who depend on Him. We see miracles in the Old Testament. We see plenty of miracles in the New Testament. One of my favorite passages is, why do you need to worry about clothes? He takes care of the lilies of the valley so beautifully. Do you think he's going to take care of them more than you? He cares for the sparrows. He gives them food. He provides for them. Isn't he going to provide for you even more? When we let go of the things of this world and we depend upon him, we become like that strong tree with the deep roots. We're meant to be dependent upon him. But we're also created and designed to be dependent on one another. We don't like to need other people. We like to be, what, people who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. We like to be people who can do it all on our own. I know this because I'm probably one of the worst offenders. I like to do things by myself. Group projects, are I'm not a fan. I don't like when I need other people. But you know what? We all need to be able to depend on one another. We all need to be people that others can depend on. We are not created to exist by ourselves and keep our Christianity to ourselves and, and to just live in isolation. We're created for community with one another. We're created to be in relationship with one another. We are created to hold one another up. When one of us stumbles, we're designed 
to be the body of Christ and lift them up and carry them until they can walk again. Scripture has a lot to say about us actually being a body, being a single unit, being people who live and work together in harmony. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church and he's, he's explaining to them, listen, don't fight about what part of the body you are. Some parts are given extra honor because maybe they do a, a, a less desirable job and some people, you might see them up front, but you know their, their job is not more important than this job. And he's trying to put out some fires because people seem to be not understanding that when the whole body does well, everybody's thriving. When, when everybody's working together, that's when the body can do the best for the kingdom. So we come in partway through his uh, correction to them. He says, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are that body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Each one of us is part of this body of believers here in this church. We're also part of the body of believers collectively. Each one of us has a role to play. Each one of us has something to do to be the body that God has called us to be. It's not just the pastors. It's not just those on the worship team. It's not just those you see serving. It's everybody is called to serve in some way. There are so many people who serve that you never see them on a stage, but their job is just as important as this job. And this scripture is telling us and reminding us that, y'all, we need each other. We need every person who is serving. We need us all to serve together, and we need each other. We need to be in relationship with one another. We need to be able to depend on our brothers and sisters, knowing that they will have our back as we are working for the kingdom of God. Let there be no division among you. Let there be no bickering among you. Let there be no jealousy. Whatever words you want to put in there says you are all needed. It says that when one part does well and is praised, the whole body should rejoice and be encouraged. He says, but when one part of you is suffering, the whole body suffers. If your appendix is causing you to be sick, your whole body suffers. You are not functioning the way that you were supposed to function. Something is wrong. You're not able to live like you normally do. We need to be dependent upon one another to keep us walking in the right direction. But we also need to make sure that we are people that our brothers and sisters can depend on. That we are going to be there for them just like we need them to be there for us. And let me tell you, this one is really hard. Especially if you've ever been let down by a person. We all have at some point. But the more we depend upon God and the more we lean upon Him, the more we will grow into the person and the people we need to be for this dependence to begin to form. We're not meant to live our Christianity alone to walk the journey alone, to learn alone. We're meant to do that in community. We are meant to be people who are okay with being dependent upon God first and foremost. And then be people who are okay with being dependent upon one another, knowing that we can. I found um, something called the Declaration of Dependence. Y'all, you've been thinking about the Declaration of Independence probably the whole time I've been talking. I know that because I've been doing it too. But there's an author, it's actually Pastor Eric Raymond. He came up with what he calls the Declaration of Dependence. He says, as a believer, I realize that I am depending on Christ for his perfect obedience to the Father, for I did not obey for his sinless perfection, for I am sinful. For his wrath satisfi satisfying death, for I am unable to satisfy eternal wrath. For his perfect righteousness before the judgment bar, for I have deficient righteousness. For his ability to keep me safe, for I cannot keep myself from wandering away. 
His sovereign ability to rule the world, for I struggle with organizing my days. His unfailing love, for I trip on myself daily. His ultimate motivation for life and ministry, for I have nothing in myself that trumps this. His priceless blood that will never depreciate, for I have no means to pay. It is good, therefore, to declare dependence upon the Savior, knowing that there is a day coming when those who are gathered together in his kingdom will unite in numbers that will dwarf the fireworks crowds to declare dependence upon King Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. We are to live in dependence upon one another. Dependence upon God, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. Loving them the way that we love ourselves. Being there when they need it. And that means that we'll correct them when they need it. And that means they'll correct us when we need it. It means we're going to love them through whatever comes their way. And they're going to love us through whatever comes our way. We are created. We're designed for dependence. And this leads us into the final point I have for this morning. We, I tripped over my notes, we live out this dependence through faithfulness. We live out this dependence through faithfulness because I know, I know that as I've been talking about independence and dependence, we have sometimes skewed ideas of what this means. When I say to be dependent upon God, some of us don't like the way that that sounds. We don't like the connotation there. But the truth is that to be dependent upon God means that we are constantly in motion, that we are working towards what it looks like to live out our faith. Scripture, this book, tells us what it means to live a faithful life in Jesus. It tells us how to live. It tells us how to act This book tells us how to seek out God and how to live a faithful life. Scripture reminds us that as we seek out God, he will meet us there. As we seek, we will find. As we knock, doors will be opened. As we live in faithfulness, we will become more and more dependent upon God. It's not that, well, I'm dependent upon God, so I guess I'm going to sit around and wait for him to do something. That's not being dependent upon God. That's just being a little bit lazy. Depending on God means that we put in our work, that we do what Scripture says, that we're reading Scripture, that we're praying, that we're taking care of the least of these, that we're taking care of the orphan and the widow, that we are being like Jesus, that we are doing everything we can, knowing that we can never do enough, but that He will meet us in that, and He is the one who will change us. When we live out what he calls us to, we're showing our dependence upon him, saying, I'm here, I'm doing what you've called me to do. Now meet me in this and actually do the work in me, please. We're putting ourselves in the spot where he can come and transform us. The more, the more we live what he calls us to, the more we will be drawn into who he is and what he's doing The more we depend on him, the more our faithfulness will grow. And the more our faithfulness grows, the more dependent upon him we will become. The more like him we will become. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the story that I have in my notes. Uh, From Matthew 25, I'm sure you're familiar with this story of um, this this rich master, he's going away on a trip and he calls three guys to himself and he says, hey, while I'm gone, I want you to take care of my affairs. I want you to do, um, to do the work that I normally do. I want you to take care of my finances. So he gives one a few bags of gold. He gives another one a little bit less, but he gives them gold nonetheless and says, okay, go do this work. And the last guy gets one bag of gold. He gives to each according to their ability. And he says, okay, while I'm gone, it's your job to care for this. So he goes away for a long time. It's an extended trip. We don't know how long. So the guy who's given the most, he doubles, 
his money. He doubles the master's money. He works hard and he does what the master wants him to do. I don't know what the business is, but he works hard and he does it. He doubles the money that he's been given. The second guy, same thing. He doubles his money. The third guy, though, is afraid. And he says, well, I don't know what to do. I'm not really sure what to do. And he buries it. And he says, okay, that's going to be good. He's at least going to get back. I protected what he gave me and nothing happened to it. And so he thinks he's doing good. And the master comes back. He says, okay, guys, um, you know, come and show me what you did while I was gone. And the first two, they come before him and says, well, here, you gave me gold and I doubled what you gave me. I worked so hard. I did what you told me to do. And there's a great, good job, good and faithful servant, you know, come in and to the master's house and, and get rewarded. You've been given a little bit. You've been faithful with it. I'm going to give you even more. And then the last guy comes in and, and he says, well, here's the money back that you gave me. And the master looks at him and says, what did you do? Why, why didn't you even put it in a bank and like even gain me interest? Like, why did you bury it? He says, you're, you're not a good servant. You didn't do what I told you to do. You didn't take care of my interest. You didn't do what I had asked you to do, which was watch over what I entrusted you with. Instead, you buried it and you ignored it. And he doesn't get to welcomed in. He actually gets thrown out into outer darkness it's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to live faithfully. We're supposed to take action in our lives. We're supposed to use what God has given us. And as we are faithfully living out what he has called us to live, he will work in that. He will meet us there and he will double it. He will do the work in us that we cannot do and he will do the work around us that we cannot do. As we step out and we are obedient to the things he has called us to, that's showing that we are living truly dependent upon him and not on what we want, not on how we want to live, not on the things that we can do, but we're taking that step of faith. It feels kind of risky, but we're saying, I'm going to do what he has called me to do, and then he will meet you there. And he's going to grow it. But when we choose to say, no, nah, I don't want to do that, and we go back to that independence thing, and we bury it, and we put it away, that's not for me, that's not what he's called me to, that can't be where he's calling me, uh, that's however we say it, and we bury it, and what did you do with it? Nothing. That's not living dependent upon God, that's living in accordance with what we want, and that's not living faithfully. This morning, I was not planning to invite anybody down and to do any anointing. But there's so many things that have happened in the last few days where we got to say, the, listen, we can't do this. I can't step into these situations, but God can. So we took the step of acting faithfully because scripture says, pray. Pray for our neighbors, pray for our friends, pray for our unsaved loved ones, pray in all things, pray, pray unceasing, bring it to God because we can't do it, but he can. And when we live faithfully, when we live dependent upon God, our life becomes, well, I'm going to do what God has called me to do because I know that he's going to meet me there and do so much more that I can never do. We live out our lives each day by choosing to walk in dependence upon God or walk in the independence of what I want to do. The way that we are called to live is to be dependent upon God. That's how we are created. We're never going to find the peace and the happiness and the satisfaction that we are looking for when we are trying to live our own way, doing our own thing, making our own rules and trying to live to them. The only, way we, the only way that we will ever find joy, happiness, peace is when we give up this independence and we recognize that it is only in dependence upon God that we will ever actually be free. It is only as we surrender to Him completely giving him everything that we will find peace and joy and love and faithfulness. It is the faithfulness of our lives lived out each and every single day 
that actually shows we are dependent upon God. Choosing to live for Him, even when it's hard. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when we don't maybe even really want to. That's when we show that we are really dependent upon God and on His plan for us and not our plan. And He meets us there. And He grows us. And He stretches us. And He makes us more and more like Him. None of us likes the idea of being dependent. I know that. But that's what Scripture calls us to. Are we depending upon God or are we depending upon us? Are we living the faithful lives that he calls us to? Are we living the lives that we want? We're never going to find what we're looking for apart from giving him everything. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for how you have met us here. Lord, I thank you for a time where we can gather in prayer. We can lift up the community around us, Father. And I pray again that you would just touch every situation. Lord, I thank you that you are here for us. That you will never leave us. That you will never forsake us. That you are always here. That we can depend on you. Thank you, Father, for calling us for raising us up, for calling us to be your children. Father, make us into the people you have called us to be. Make us into the community like the early church where we can depend upon one another like family. Lord, may we depend upon you and not on ourselves, not on our world, not on our jobs, not on anything else, Lord, but may we look to you first and foremost. Father, I pray that as we seek to live for you and to live faithfully, Lord, show us what it is you are calling us to and meet us there. Raise us up to be pillars of your church, Father. Raise us up to be people who love you with everything we've got and who hold nothing back. Lord, we choose to depend upon you and not ourselves. Work in us in whatever way we need in these moments, I pray. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Amen. Let's close out with a song, bring praise to God.